Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael McElligot, Michael M. Uh, for the Long Now Foundation. We're so glad you're here. Uh, this is uh, going to be a fantastic talk. It's, it's something that's near and dear to our hearts here. As you can tell, uh, we do like books, and we like uh, both the science and the fiction, and uh, to, to realize they should actually be kind of classified as the same thing, well, we're going to get into that tonight. Um, so Anna Lee, uh, as you may know, She's the founding editor of io9.com. She's currently the editor-at-large at Ars Technica. Um, she's the author of Autonomous. And I want to give a shout out to Borderlands Books, our great local sci-fi and other awesome genre bookstore in the back. Thank you, Jude and team. We love it when we've got, uh, and so they've got uh, both Annalise's uh, novel and her, her nonfiction, uh, which you can buy tonight. She's going to hang out and sign it afterwards. She's also going to answer more of your questions because we won't be able to, to, to answer all of them, I'm sure, uh, during the talk. So we hope you'll stick around. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be here afterwards, and she will be signing books afterwards, and we'll be selling more books afterwards as well. Um, so uh, here we have an, an author, uh, a novelist, a journalist, a thinker who has hands-on experience in both the fantastic and the concrete, in the imagining and the documenting, and she's going to explain to us how it all fits together. Let's have a big round of applause for Annalie Newitz. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much, and thanks, uh, Michael, for inviting me to be part of this series. And um, I just, I love the interval, and if I ever have a spaceship, I want the industrial design inside of it to look like this. So <laughs> that's my plan. Um, and part of the reason why I wanted to have these space robots here, um, I'm not going to talk a lot about space robots, maybe sort of peripherally, um, but uh, I was, as a kid, uh, inspired a lot by Voyager, and of course, one of my first grown-up science fiction films um, starred Voyager, who had become a sentient being who went by V'ger. And when I was seven years old, the reveal at the end when it was Voyager, I was like, fuck, so deep. Um, so, that, so that's been, been with me since I was a kid, both the real uh, spacecraft and the science fictional version of it uh, who came to life. Um, so as Michael said, um, I am a science journalist and I also write science fiction, which means I'm in this kind of uh, space in the middle of uh, fiction and nonfiction. Um, and, and a lot of my nonfiction tends to have speculation in it, um, speculative moments, and my science fiction uh, is very much grounded in science. And I have had a lot of fun interviewing scientists and getting them to think about some of the, the issues in my book and then just stealing their ideas and putting them into fiction. Um, and, uh, and my project really throughout my adult life as I've been working uh, in this kind of space is to carve out a spot where um, you know, science fiction can kind of be uh, the cultural wing of the scientific project. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about how that might work tonight. Um, and it's definitely not an injunction. I'm not saying like, OK, scientists, you have to make room for me now. Uh, <laughs> but it's just a kind of uh, a way of thinking about where does science fiction and where does fiction fit into the scientific project? Because the scientific project, of course, goes way beyond the borders of the laboratory, as we know. Um, so I started my career as an academic um, at, at UC Berkeley, and I wrote my dissertation on, um, yeah, Berkeley, um, and uh, I wrote my dissertation on how, in, in part, on how images of science and technology in pop culture um, affect people's uh, perception of politics. Um, and then I escaped from academia and started creating uh, images of science and technology and pop culture. Um, so that was a, an odd journey. Um, and so I, when I left uh, the ivory tower, um, I spent many years writing about technology and writing about the social impact of technology. Um, I had a column uh, that ran in newspapers for a long time called Textploitation, which some of you might remember um, if you were reading newspapers in the 90s um, or the early noughties. Um, <laughs> like one person is like, paper! Um, it was online too, okay. <laughs> it was legit. Um, and, uh, and then I slowly shifted into thinking about science, um, and I was lucky enough to be able to found a blog called io9, um, along with Charlie Jane Andrews, who's sitting right here. Um, 
and uh, which was part of a larger company that was at the time known as Gawker Media and is now called Gizmodo Media, and that's a long story that we won't go into. Um, but uh, that was my first chance to really have a space where people uh, who were the contributors and the staffers were writing about both science fiction and science. And we had very, we, they still have, io9 is still going, uh, very serious cultural analysis of where science fiction kind of fits into our world, but also really paying attention to scientific discoveries and technological innovations and doing very high quality science journalism as well. And it was definitely in imitation of the old Omni magazine, which also used to do that and which was a huge influence on me and all right thinking people. Um, and uh, and I, I wanted to continue that tradition of, of blending the two and bringing speculation and storytelling into the scientific project. Um, and so while I was at io9, wow, I have not been advancing my slides, I'm so sorry. Um, there's the opening slide. <laughs> um, so while I was at io9, um, I wrote uh, a nonfiction book called Scatter, Adapt, and Remember, um, which is about uh, mass extinction, which uh, is something that we're actually facing now. A lot of environmental scientists believe that we're kind of in the early stages of a mass extinction. Um, and my book was, I don't want to say it was optimistic, but of course it was about how we might survive a mass extinction as a species, which many people considered to be so outrageously utopian uh, that they just threw the book down in disgust. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. I want to talk a little bit about utopian and dystopian visions and how they fit into the scientific project. Um, I didn't actually think it was wildly utopian. I actually thought it was pretty dystopian because I was saying, well, we're surviving, but we'll, we'll be doing it by living in caves and eating bugs. Um, not that there's anything bad about eating bugs. I love bugs. Um, <laughs> they seem tasty. Um, so, uh, and so since, this t since that time, since I worked at io9 for almost eight years and worked on this book, um, I've become a freelancer. I've turned to um, writing my first science fiction novel, um, which I will do a little reading from later. Just I have a few snippets that I'll read to you from and talk about that. Um, but this novel, Autonomous, grew out of a lot of the work that I was doing as a science journalist. In fact, as I said, a lot of it was just stolen straight from science stories that I'd been writing, um, partly about uh, the development of machine learning, um, but also about uh, the development of pharmaceuticals. And there's two main characters in the novel who you'll meet, uh, not in real life, but <laughs> when, I re when I wish in real life, that would be really interesting. Um, but uh, one of the characters is a pharmaceutical pirate. She's a former synthetic biologist who's been working on gene therapies in, in academia, but she realizes that all of her work is tied up in patents and corporate interests. And so in order to bring medicine to people she feels need, need it, poor people, um, she goes rogue and starts reverse engineering expensive drugs and selling them very cheaply or giving them away for free. So she kind of gets in trouble, as you do, uh, when you're stealing drugs from pharmaceutical companies. Um, and so a corporation sends a robot after her, a robot and a human companion, to track her down. Um, and so the novel kind of goes back and forth between their perspectives, that of this pirate who doesn't respect intellectual property laws, um, and a robot who is property, but who's also a conscious human equivalent being. So um, that was, uh, that just came out, um, and it got nominated for Nebula, so that was, I was pretty psyched. <laughs> um, so before I talk about, because I want to I wanna kind of delve into the process of what it means to try to write science fiction that's informed by real science, but before that I just want to um, define some terms here because I think that science fiction can mean a lot of things, fiction can mean a lot of things. Um, so when I talk about science fiction, um, and here we have Spock looking at a tricorder, um, he, he has that sort of cute puzzled expression that he always has. Um, so yay, Spock. Uh, so uh, you know, there's this common belief uh, among um, readers, and I think some science fiction writers, that science fiction succeeds when it predicts the future. And you always see articles in places like Gizmodo or popular science that are all about like which science fiction got it right and which ones got it wrong. You know, which ones you know actually predicted that we would have cell phones or uh, revenge porn or whatever, um, and which didn't. Um, and I think that like like a lot of science fiction writers like Cory Doctorow and William Gibson, I don't believe that we're wizards that who can predict the future. Like if I could do that. 
that would be awesome, um, but that is not within my power. Uh, and I, science fiction is generally about the present. It's about exploring the ways that science fits into our culture and our society and projecting it into a speculative realm. So that speculative realm might be the future, it might be an alternative history, it might be a fantasy world, uh, but that's really, when I approach science fiction, I'm approaching it not as a predictive tool, but as a tool for world building. And I'll talk a little bit more about world building uh, as I go along, but basically by world building, I just mean a way of thinking about science or technology in the context of the full world. And there's some science fiction writers, uh, for example, Kim Stanley Robinson, um, who Michael mentioned was here, um, who really take that quite seriously and try to build an entire world for you in their work, um, which I love. The novel 2312, which is one of my favorite Kim Stanley Robinson novels, really is an effort to build an entire civilization for you to understand the context for all of the scientific developments and technological developments and how they are embedded in political practices and social practices. Um, and then there's other writers um, who think about that same question but from a very personal angle. Um, like Philip K. Dick is a great example of that. Um, N.K. Jemisin, whose Broken Earth trilogy just like rocked the world uh, recently. Um, both of them explore how technology impacts people's personal lives, their psychology, how it mutates our psychology. Um, and so that's another exercise in world building. So world building doesn't have to just mean that I go full Ursula Le Guin and like build a planet and tell you about every single political faction on the planet. It can also mean just taking a character and thinking about how does this technology change her relationship with someone or her relationship with herself? Um, so that's kind of my, my view of it. And, you know, I think there's a huge temptation now, especially, to really focus on the predictive aspects of science fiction because we're at a point historically where it just seems like almost anything that we could imagine in sci-fi could come true. And there's that kind of urge to say, well, let's read science fiction to get ideas for things to build because it's, it's all possible. We have such advanced technology, we have advanced fabrication techniques, uh, we're making strides in a lot of areas of scientific discovery. Um, so why not just think of science fiction as kind of a test bed? Um, and I was thinking about this especially the other day because um, Elon Musk, um, he was being kind of musky on Twitter, um, and he was, <laughs> you might have seen this, he, he tweeted, um, hey you guys, I'm gonna build a candy factory and it's gonna be awesome. And, um, and it was funny and like a million people responded and one person responded and said, um, come on Elon, we don't want a candy factory, we want you to make Westworld real. And, um, and Elon Musk was like, yeah, or something, like he said something funny <laughs> in response. And to me, that's a perfect example of people kind of using science fiction in the wrong way. I'm sure this person was joking. I don't think that he really wanted Westworld to be real, I hope. Um, but, you know, the point of Westworld is not to watch it and be like, dude, I want like a sex robot or like a cowboy robot who I can murder over and over again and like implant with like several layers of PTSD until he has like no identity other than his fear of death. Um, you know, the point, Westworld is very much about thinking about that technology of human equivalent AI in a robotic body embedded in a political structure, embedded in a um, corporate structure, embedded in a social structure, and how that plays out. Because of course, the message of Westworld is not build these robots. It's like, no, 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 no! <laughs> Don't build these robots like this. <laughs> uh, if you build robots and you place them in this context, um, you're creating slaves who are horrifically abused. And uh, that's not what we want to do um, as people who are interested in advancing the scientific project. So now I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about how I go about building worlds as a fiction writer. Um, when I set out to write Autonomous, I spent a lot of time looking at this map um, which is from, it's actually two maps, I'm sorry. Uh, it's from a, a paper that came out in 2013 in uh, the, proceeding, the, na the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, commonly referred to as PNAS. Um, so <laughs> in my head, I was like, PNAS. Um, <laughs> they all think that's funny over there too. They don't mind that joke. Um, but uh, this, is a, this is from a paper about the impact of climate change 
on the Arctic. Um, you can see one is showing, uh, and it's showing shipping routes. So one, on the left, you can see ship, current shipping routes up to 2015. Uh, and then projected shipping routes from 2040 to 2059. One of my characters, the pirate, Jack, of course, she has a pirate ship because she's a pirate, um, and it's this badass submarine that she uses to kind of crisscross the Arctic to get from the manufacturing pl uh, point for her drugs to a distribution point. And so partly this was just, I needed to think about how would she do it? You know, what would it look like to cross the Arctic Sea uh, at a time when most of the ice has melted? And that's exactly the point here, is that once that ice melts, um, you're gonna see a lot more shipping lanes uh, taking up space and of course leaving you know, debris behind and, and polluting and all kinds of other stuff, disturbing uh, you know, wildlife habitats. Uh, but also, the thing that's interesting, I like to start with maps when I'm doing world building because this map, actually poses a lot of questions. Like, for one thing, it poses the question of, like, what's happening with climate change? That's really obvious. Um, but then it's saying not just what's going to happen to the environment, but what will happen, happen to the economy, because this is about shipping lanes, it's about cargo. Uh, so how will that impact the economy? Um, it's also about politics, because which nations will have access to it is a big question. Um, but also, for me, uh, as I was thinking about Jack in her submarine, like zooming along in the, in the um, Arctic Sea, I was like, how does she get internet? And because she's constantly online, she's doing a bunch of stuff, and I was like, okay, I have to come up with that. I have to build a, my world to make that happen. And so I came up with this idea, which may be total crap, but this is what I came up with, um, that there are moats that serve as internet relay nodes. This is the future, kids. It's 125 years in the future, so there's these tiny, tiny little relays um, that are dusted into the air by airplanes. And if you're rich enough, your town gets a nice dusting of internet relay points, and they're just in the air. Um, and if you're not, you know, your community has really shitty internet access, but because of the fact that the Arctic is like a major shipping route, it's, it's being dusted regularly with these moats. And so suddenly I had a way to have her have internet access that made sense, um, and also uh, embedded in this economy where certain places have access and certain people don't. Um, so I'm gonna read you a short uh, piece from the novel where I introduce Jack um, and just describe Basically, it's a sneaky way of introducing you to the tech in the world. You're supposed to be just, you know, meeting the character, and it's like, there's action, kind of. But actually, it's just me being like, dude, let me tell you about all the tech. <laughs> so she's been, she's been online, so this is why she, it starts with her taking goggles off, because she's uh, reading the internet using kind of squishy goggles. Jack Chen unstuck the goggles from her face and squeezed the deactivated lenses into the front pocket of her coveralls. She'd been working in the sun's glare for so long that pale rings circled her dark brown eyes. It was a farmer's tan, like the one on her father's face after a long day wearing goggles in the canola fields, watching tiny yellow flowers emit streams of environmental data. Probably, Jack reflected, it was the same farmer's tan that had afflicted every Chen for generations. It went back to the days when her great-great-grandparents came across the Pacific from Shenzhen and brought an agricultural franchise in the prairies outside Saskatoon. No matter how far she was from home, some things did not change. But some things did. Jack sat cross-legged in the middle of the Arctic Sea, balanced on the gently curving, uncanny invisibility of her submarine's hull. From a few hundred kilometers above the surface, where satellites roamed, the sub's negative refractive index would bend light until Jack seemed to float incongruously atop the waves. Spread next to her in the bright water was an undulating sheet of non-reflective solar panels. Jack made a crumpling gesture with her hand, and the solar array swarmed back into its dock, disappearing beneath a panel in the hull. The sub's batteries were charged, her network traffic was hidden in a blur of legitimate data, and she had a hold full of drugs. It was time to dive. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Jack is so badass. Um, so anyway, what you can see in that scene, like I said, it's a bit of a kind of sneak info dump because it's basically me saying like, let me introduce you to the tech in this world. Um, and part of it is that they have fantastic sustainable technology. She's got these great solar panels that are basically like crumply paper that she can store all mashed up inside her hull. Um, all of the energy that we see people using in the novel is sustainable energy, it's alternative energy. People are building with sustainable materials. Um, and it's in, partly in response to stuff like this because they're living in a world where there's no more Arctic ice, We've really been seeing the results of climate change. And so, in many ways, uh, and, and people reading the novel have said to me that they're a bit surprised at how utopian it is because there's all of this amazing green technology and cities that are, you know, thriving by having um, skyscraper farms and um, collecting light, uh, you know, for energy. Um, but at the same time, it's not a perfect world because I really wanted to make it as realistic as possible. And so, of course, one of the big tools in your toolbox as a fiction writer is you get to have characters. Um, and characters are a big part of world building because, of course, as you're thinking about how technology affects the world, it kind of comes down to how does it affect people? You know, it's not... I think there's this misnomer. This is Paladin, <laughs> uh, the robot. This is actually not Paladin. This is Bria Rios from Appleseed. How many people know what Appleseed is? Yay! <laughs> it's a really great anime. You should check it out. Um, Bria Rios is a super sexy cyborg. Um, and I kind of modeled the character of Paladin, who's the robot in my novel, after uh, this anime bot. Um, but, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about characters and we're thinking about how they interact with tech and science, um, I find that it's really important to keep in mind that technology doesn't change the world. It's about how people receive technology and deploy technology. Person is oh, a person or a person-like creature always has to be the subject of any sentence that is about what technology is doing, right? It's not like suddenly there's robots and robots change things. It's, it's about how do people use those robots. Um, and so I'm going to read you a little bit from uh, the introduction to Paladin um, and give you a sense of what I mean by that, about how people are using this technology. Um, and so this is a scene where um, we first are kind of meeting Paladin uh, Paladin is, like I said, a big giant bot. Uh, he has giant um, shields that look like wings because I just couldn't help but make him super badass. He has like <laughs> lasers and shit. Um, he's got all the stuff, all the sexy stuff. Um, and Paladin is about to go be deployed on this mission to chase down Jack um, and has just met his human partner whose name is Elias. And so he and Elias are doing a training exercise. And Elias says, where are you from, Paladin? Mm -hmm. I suppose I am from the Kagu Robotics Factory in Cape Town, he vocalized. No, no, no. Elias shook his head violently, then wrapped his knuckles on Paladin's lower back. I mean, where are you from originally? Where is your brain from? Huh. Under its layers of abdominal shielding, Paladin's biobrain floated in a thick mixture of shock gel and cerebrospinal fluid. There was a fat interface wire between it and the physical substrate of his mind. The brain took care of his facial recognition functions, assigning each person he met a unique identifier based on the edges and shadows of their expressions. But its file system was largely incompatible with his own. He used it mostly like a graphics processor. He certainly had no idea where it was from, beyond the fact that a dead human working for the Federation military had donated it. Elias spoke again. Isn't it important to you to know who you really are? Why you feel what you do? None of Paladin's emotions or ethics were processed in his human brain. But then Elias looked right into the sensor array mounted on Paladin's face, his eyes dark and attentive. Suddenly, Paladin didn't really want to explain his file system architecture anymore. <laughs> it happens to me all the time. Um, I don't know where my brain is from, he replied simply. I can't access its memories. And so 
Then they have a bit more of a conversation where Elias is like, they should let you remember, because Elias has probably seen a lot of movies like Robocop, where the brain matters. Um, and Paladin is like, I don't know what, I don't know what to say. Um, and then Paladin is, and then they're deployed. They get a message saying that they're going to be deployed. And Paladin is thinking about going on the mission. Though the mission was fairly small scale and routine, it held a special significance for Paladin because it meant he'd crossed over from development to deployment. Today marked the first day of his indenture to the African Federation. International law mandated that his service could last no more than 10 years, a period deemed more than enough time to make the Federation's investment in creating a new life form worthwhile. Though he was just beginning his term of indenture, Paladin had heard enough around the factory to know that the Federation interpreted the law fairly liberally. He might be waiting to receive his autonomy key for 20 years. More likely, he would die before ever getting it. But he wanted to survive. That urge was part of his programming. It was what defined him as human equivalent and therefore deserving autonomy. The bot had no choice but to fight for his life. Still, to Paladin, it didn't feel like a lack of choice. It felt like hope. So, <clears throat> I know, poor Paladin. He, he has, she has a rough time. I actually switch pronouns back and forth for Paladin because one of the things that happens in the middle of the book, and this is not really a spoiler, is that Paladin starts to use, starts to, Paladin experiments with using a female pronoun for a lot of different reasons, partly having to do with that sexy look that Elias uh, gave her earlier. Um, but one of the things, there were a few things that I wanted to call out in that scene and talk about in relation to how a character can help you think about technology in a social context. One is that you see Elias completely misunderstanding how the robot's mind works, right? This is a user who's approaching this device and thinks that, that the seat of its, of its consciousness is in the brain because humans have brains and our brains are the seat of our consciousness. So he's completely misunderstood that. He's misunderstood Paladin's relationship with Paladin's brain. Um, and in many ways throughout the novel, Elias's misunderstanding of Paladin kind of shaped the way Paladin feels about herself, uh, the way he moves through the world, uh, because Elias also assumes that because Paladin is a big, bulky, armored creature, the paladin must be male. But paladin is a robot and robots don't have gender. So paladin's like, what do you, wait, why do you think I'm male? And why do you even care? And why does it matter to humans? What is this whole gender thing? So paladin is like super confused uh, by gender. Um, and we also get this look inside paladin's consciousness and how paladin responds to his programming. And again, that's something that when we think about robots, you know, we're humans, right? So we think about like, how do we program them to do things, but not how it would subjectively feel to have those programs running. And I wanted to point out that, you know, when we think about making a creature who is alive or artificially alive, oftentimes scientists and technologists will say, well, the thing that defines a life form is that they fight to survive. Um, and so therefore we'll program in our, our, our <laughs> strong AI, fight to survive. Um, and that is something that Paladin has no choice about, right? It's programmed in, just the way it's programmed into us, that we fight for our lives and we fight to survive. But as humans, just like Paladin, we don't think about that as programming. We don't think like, oh, the fact that I have no choice but to fight for my life uh, means that I've been programmed and I have no choices. We feel like a sense of hope because of that. We feel like that fighting for that survival is, is a hopeful thing. And so I wanted to remind readers that you know, the way that we think about our technology um, isn't always the way that other people will think about it, especially the technology itself, if it ever becomes sentient, which is a big debate. Um, but I really, I think it's important to think about especially how people mistake the way technology functions. Um, and that's, a, like I said, a big part of the book. Um, so I wanted to end by talking a little bit about, um, in my talk about the book, by just saying that one of the big uh, focuses I've had in my work has been trying to get out of the idea that there's such a thing as a dystopia or a utopia. Um, because of the fact that my book has slavery in it, um, the robots are indentured um, until they're 10, um, and as a result of that, 
lawyer, clever corporate lawyers have figured out a way to make humans indentured as well, because of course robots are human equivalent, so if robots are human equivalent, why not have some human slavery too? That's great. Um, but it's indenture, it's freely entered into, it's not really like slavery. Um, it's actually kind of nice, right? Because somebody pays for your meals, you get to have a house, um, so you can see why people would love that idea. Um, so, uh, so that's very dystopian, the idea of reinventing slavery uh, in, the, in the 21st century. Um, but at the same time, the book is full of this incredible green technology, sustainable technology. People are dealing really well with trying to conserve uh, and, and uh, preserve the environment. So it's a little dystopia, it's a little utopia, it's just topia. And I think as, you know, as we think about science in the context of stories and in the context of these kinds of world building maps, it's important to remember that as we move into the future, we're not really heading toward a world where things tend toward getting better and better and better by some person's definition of better and better or really worse and worse. We're always in these middle phases where some things are getting better for some people, some things are getting worse for some people. Um, the reality is that even if we you know, achieve some kind of goal like, say, universal health care for all, there's going to be another problem that comes up. So we're never going to reach a point where, like, you know, we become light-filled beings and beam out of existence like in Star Trek. Um, there's always going to be these problems that come up, and I think science sometimes makes the mistake, those of us working in science or technology, of thinking, but it's getting better and better and better and better, and, like, everybody's just going to be fine, and it's like, Nope, there's always going to be new problems, and we need to think about what those problems are going to be. Brand new, awesome problems. Um, and this is, um, I'm just going to tell you briefly about my next project, uh, which kind of grows out of these concerns about the new problems and the old problems uh, kind of haunting the new problems. Um, I'm working on a nonfiction book about uh, ancient abandoned cities or lost cities, although they're not really lost. Um, and thinking about cities like Angkor, um, that is a LiDAR image of Angkor that was taken quite recently uh, that reveals that, in fact, Angkor the city, not the kind of walled area of Angkor Thom and Angkor Wat, which you can see Angkor Thom is at the top, it's that big kind of rectangle, and then at the bottom you can see Angkor Wat. Um, all of the rest of this stuff is a city grid that's been obscured by jungle, it's been obscured by time, but the LiDAR can pick up uh, you know, minute, like, centimeter level um, shifts in the, in, the, in the height of the ground um, and is able to recreate that city grid which has stood the test of time over a thousand years. And what that means is now we know that Angkor, in fact, was the biggest city in the world about a thousand years ago. There were a million people living there. Um, and we can see where they lived and how they walked to work um, and where they got their water. Um, and the, the city even though it was so big and so incredible, um, suffered from uh, incredible political problems, particularly around infrastructure maintenance. Uh, they had to preserve uh, all year round, they had to have uh, water in giant reservoirs because they had seasons of rain and seasons of incredible dryness. Um, and so maintaining reservoirs was really important uh, for the city. And slowly over time, as those reservoirs decayed and the political leaders didn't fix them, uh, the city became less and less interesting for people to live in, shall we say. <laughs> um, and they started to move away. Um, and so I've been thinking about Angkor and the other cities that I'm, that I'm working on um, as kind of models for the problems that we're having in cities today. Um, and that brings me to my final thing that I want to say about world building and science fiction um, and how it speaks to science. Because one of the things that over the last decade, many of us working in science and technology have had the luxury to forget about is the fact that science is political. And science exists embedded in political systems. And you know, for a long time, uh, if you were working in basic research in environmental science while Obama was president, you got money from the government to do your work on alternative energy. Um, and you know, it really felt like you know, there's supporters on both sides of the aisle for technological innovation. Um, you know, people who are investing in green technology and other fields of science um, who come from all political walks of life. But recently, we've seen that that has stopped uh, being true in a lot of cases. And it has become a political issue. It's become a partisan issue. 
Um, and we're having to remember that as, sci as people working on the scientific project, that we can't forget about politics. Um, we have to um, think of our inventions and think of our discoveries in that context, whether we like it or not. Um, and people working at the intersection of culture and science have known this for a long time, uh, including Tom Lehrer. This is one of my favorite Tom Lehrer songs from the 1960s. Uh, Tom Lehrer was a physicist uh, who also was a great singer, and he still teaches at Santa Cruz. Um, and he has this famous song called Werner von Braun, who is, which was about a physicist who helped develop uh, atomic weapons and didn't really care who he worked for. Do a little work for the Germans, do a little work for the Americans, whatever. That's not his job. He called himself apolitical. Um, and I don't think we can afford to do that anymore. I think that when we think about science, we need to remember that when we're, we need to draw a map around that, that science and think about how it fits into um, all of these different areas of <clears throat> non-scientific life, all these parts of society, especially if we want to get to a future um, like what Star Trek promised us. I'm coming back to Star Trek. Um, and uh, this is a picture of um, Starfleet headquarters, which, as you know, is here in San Francisco, um, <clears throat> because we are the city of the future. And, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, if we take the scientific project seriously, what it's about is learning as much as we can about the truth of reality through experimentation, through reproducible experimentation, and then using that knowledge of the truth to inform our political decisions, to inform our economic decisions, our infrastructure decisions. It's about having evidence-based decision-making, where that evidence has been scientifically looked at, <laughs> scientifically <laughs> examined. Um, and the project of science fiction, I think, is about making sure that as we're thinking about that, as we're thinking about finding truth, that we don't forget about the fact that outside the lab, outside of the um, console where you're doing development, there's a whole map of other kinds of influences and truths. There are social truths and cultural truths that will affect how people receive your technology, how they deploy it, uh, and what it does in the world. And so storytelling is one of the best ways we have to think about that map and to place our discoveries in context so that we're not surprised or blindsided when suddenly this thing that we thought of as completely apolitical or completely peaceful in nature is suddenly used in ways that we never intended. Um, and it can also help us think about whether we even want to develop a technology in the first place. Do we really want to invent slave sex robots? I don't know. Anyway, so that's where I'll leave you. And um, if you need to reach me, I'm in some places. Um, I have a website. I have a new podcast called Our Opinions Are Correct, which I do with Charlie Jane Anders over here. Um, <clears throat> But, but you're not going away quite yet. Uh, do you want to grab a, yes, grab tell a me chair? Yes, tell me what Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, Thanks. So, uh, so we've got some time for questions. Uh, Joe's going to be walking around with the mic. Where are you, Joe? Extend it up in the air. Joe's there in the back. Uh, get Joe's attention, and he can get you the mic, and we can get your question into the mix. I have a couple. Yeah. Hi, Annalie. Hi, Thank you for Michael. Doing this. This yeah. Is so Thanks for having me. Um, so I have questions. So many questions. Um, me too. So <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's let's talk about forms. You did you did some helpful sort of talking about fiction, sci-fi. Let's talk about forms. So um, obviously, the science fiction novel is a is a a big form. I mean, what about smaller sort of forms even of like at the tweet level or what about you know and and what is you know hard sci-fi maybe we can go in a little bit more to do you think that the hard sci-fi which very you know has has very specific science very much in there how do you think about that compared to something that may be lighter on some of the specifics but might actually 
ask very profound questions. How do you, how do you think about how both of those are, are in the mix? I think that um, you know, we need a big ecosystem of stories. And, um, and part of the reason why I brought up Tom Lehrer is not just because he's awesome, which obviously he is, uh, but is because he wrote songs that were about kind of contextualizing science within culture. Uh, most of them are very satirical. Not all of his songs are about science, but a lot of them are. And um, I think, yeah, tweets can also fit into that. I mean, we can use, I mean, in fact, uh, today, to bring it up to the president, present, um, not to the president, <laughs> to bring it up to the present. We are um, doing so great tonight. I know, we're yeah, we're, we're really avoiding politics. Um, but Janelle Monet has an, a new album out called Dirty Computer, which is also very much about uh, science and technology in a social context, and um, it's just terrific. And I think that to the question about hard science fiction, um, I feel really ambivalent about that. I feel like there's science fiction, as I described it, which is really just fiction that's trying to think speculatively about science, to place it in the middle of one of those worlds in, in, in a map. Um, and you know, sometimes, because the writer is someone like me, I'm super nerdy. I already write about science for a living. For me, there's like nothing more fun than having those limitations of trying to make the science and technology in my novel as realistic as possible. Right. So, but that is a limitation. That means that there's certain things I can't do. Um, I'm working on a novel right now, which is about time travel. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna make it as scientific as possible. It's gonna be super awesome. Talk to a physicist. And he was like, yeah, no. Like, <laughs> actually, that's not a thing. You just have to accept that it's a literary device um, and that it's not ever going to be scientific. So You just spoiled it for all of us, you realize. I'm that, sorry. Right? Yeah, you're never going to travel through time, but my characters are traveling through time. There's a time machine up in Flin Flon, Manitoba. Um, so I think that, you know, really the hard work that fiction does, whether it's fantasy or very nerdy science fiction like mine, um, is, is providing that story context. And I mean, especially if you're doing science fiction or fantasy that's very psychological, um, like Philip K. Dick is a great example, like I said, um, where, you know, characters are like tripping out and going crazy and their minds are like dividing in half and stuff, <laughs> not very scientifically realistic, um, but it is, it is a way of reflecting how technology can affect us psychologically. So there's, depends on kind of what you're trying to do. Um, and and it's, it was great to hear you talking about the craft uh, of it a bit. It was great to get into that. Uh, on that front, with the, with the world building, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, there has to be, even though it's your novel and you get to decide everything, there are some things probably on the cutting room floor that you know, are, didn't actually, is, is that true? Are there, is there anything you didn't sort of explicate? And, and is there anything like a, because I, I wonder about this with, with creators, I guess, in general of, of different worlds. Um, if I ask you a question about how XYZ works, is it like that you go into your head and look around and figure out what it was and how that works? Or do you have to like kind of think it out imagine something to fill that space now. How, how would you extend your world or, 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 or how, do you, how do you think about the spaces that maybe haven't had a light shined on them? Um, I, there's a lot of stuff that is barely mentioned in the novel that I thought about a lot. Like I have a whole file that's just sort of like backstory stuff that, you know, about like the history that's gone, you know, it's 125 years in the future, but I filled in a whole timeline of like political changes and like how robots achieved uh, the status of human equivalent, which we barely hear about at all in the book. Um, I've written a couple short stories that are kind of set in the time when robots and AIs are trying to assert human rights. And would you um, say they're in the same world? As? Yeah, they're in the same timeline. Yeah, the same world. Um, and, uh, and so I kind of got to do that in those short stories. But, um, you know, for me, a as I was saying, like when I started, I kept looking at those maps from the scientific article about climate change. So when I think about like, for example, um, aspects of my world, I will if I'm dealing with something like climate change, I will go to the scientific literature first and, and be like, okay, what do people predict is likely to happen given contemporary computer modeling uh, and the amount of data that we have now? Um, and then that's when I get to be creative. So I, I know kind of what scientific consensus is, and then I have characters who get to walk through that world and get to live that world. Um, and the same thing with artificial intelligence. Like I was reading a lot of articles uh, by people who are working on AI, um, some of which 
I just have to be certain that they aren't thinking about how it will be perceived um, later. Um, people talking about trying to make happy slaves, for example, um, which is not a thing. Like, if you create a human equivalent being, like, there's no such thing as a thinking being that's a happy slave. Like, that's just not something that you can do. You can't make them both human equivalent and a happy slave. Um, so, uh, so that's why, I, that's where the kind of creativity and weirdness comes in, is like, okay, I invented a sexy robot, you know, <laughs> with awesome lasers. <laughs> like, just what I always wanted. <clears throat> uh, one more for me, and then we'll, we'll get uh, questions from the, the audience. Um, so, um, you know, science is a group activity, ultimately, with scientists yes. all kind of taking different pieces of, of what's going on. How do you think about... Um, other science fiction writers, I mean, when you're like gonna take on a subject like time travel, are, are you kind of doing a survey? I mean, obviously you, you would have read other time things, but how, how do you think about the other sort of ideation, the other iterations people have done through a concept like that, or even through a very specific thing? How do you, how do you think about that body of work? And then, um, yeah. I am one of those writers who loves to read a ton of stuff in the actual subgenre that I'm working in. Um, I know other writers who say like when they're working on a topic, they're just like, I don't read anything similar to it at all. I don't want to like be polluted. Um, but when I was working on Autonomous, um, I certainly was reading a ton of stuff about, um, well, scientific papers, but also a ton of science fiction about, you know, AI and about, and looking at how people were representing robots and, um, and then up into the present, like I'm still doing that all the time. And same thing with time travel. Like I definitely thought like, okay, do I want my time travel to be more like back to the future or more like primer or more like looper or like, um, you know, or more like the time machine? Um, and the answer is actually, it's not really like any of those, but, um, but I did, think about them, and it is definitely like, I mean, it's closest to being back to the future, but like, I, I thought about it, you know, I was like, okay, it kind of fits in here, and like, I just, I consider that to be the kind of cultural context for what I'm writing in, and um, not that you need to have read a ton of science fiction to enjoy it, but I think, um, for me, it's it's my canon, you know, I, I that's how I learn how to write, is by reading, so, um, yeah. All right, I think we got a question back there. Hold, make sure to hold it really close uh, to your mouth, closer than you think you need to. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, <Excellent>. thank you. <laughs> um, you touched on this a little bit from your book and in your discussion in general, but I'm curious how you hope we might navigate the difficult transition that you're talking about us moving through, where we're creating these tools that become self-aware enough that we need to allow them a certain amount of autonomy or have concerns about their suffering. I think you, you pointed to the historical um, and current examples of slavery as well as uh, the thing that came to mind for me was uh, animal suffering in the food industrial complex. And I'm, I'm curious like, what you might hope that, how we might navigate that. So I think that is something that we will navigate and what, what the best case scenario might be that you imagine. Wow, the best case scenario. <laughs> um, I don't think we're gonna, unfortunately, have the best case scenario. I really do think that um, if we do, yeah, I mean, well, as I said, I, I really think about kind of the space in between utopia and dystopia, where it's kind of a little bit of bad, a little bit of good. I'm sure that it's gonna vary a lot from country to country, for example. Um, and I think, I mean, for me, like a best case scenario would be if we ever are approaching having human equivalent intelligence, which is a big if. We don't really know if we're, we're gonna get there. I know Google thinks that we are and, and yay um, for them. Uh, I hope they're thinking about all this stuff. Uh, I, I mean, I would hope that we would be doing some equivalent of trying to check in and communicate with what we're making and asking, like, how you doing? Um, but that's a tall order because we don't know exactly what AI will be like when it emerges. Um, I tend to think that it might be something like an extremely non-neurotypical mind. So we might not recognize communication, it might be trying to tell us stuff and we won't necessarily know because it's not using the kind of communication that we are used to. I think about this a lot with um, 
animals like dolphins, where there's clearly an intelligence there, we know that they have names for each other, we know that they communicate using uh, verbalizations, vocalizations, as scientists say, they don't want to call it a language, but it is. Um, and, and one of the problems that scientists have had is that we can't get dolphins to learn English. You know, like, so they, and so then, you know, there's this idea like, well, they're not really smart because they're not like dogs who understand when we say fetch. Um, because they only speak like dolphin, you know? And, uh, and so us having to learn dolphin is considered, it, it, somehow we, we revalue that as like, well, that must mean that the dolphins are stupid because they can't learn English, um, instead of maybe considering the possibility that we're stupid because we haven't learned or dolphin. Or English is stupid. Or English is stupid. English is stupid. Come on, English, we love English. Um, it's the world's language. Um, yay, colonization. Um, so yeah, we, we conquered the world with English. Um, so I think that, I mean, what I would hope is that that what we're learning in the process of doing things like trying to communicate with really radically different consciousness in animals might aid us, but I do think we're going to have a pretty rough time for a while. I think there's going to be um, a lot of abuse. Another uh, question there. And then. Thank you for tonight's talk. Um, I'm very curious about this distinction of utopian and dystopian. It's something that, um, that comes up here at Long Now quite a bit. And you know, there's definitely been, the pendulum seems to swing in the utopian space to the dystopian space. And we seem to be, you know, in the, about 40 years ago, we were very much in the, or maybe 50 and 60 years ago, we were going through a very utopian space. And now we're going through a much more dystopian space. And I noticed that the science fiction of the utopian space seems to think um, and project much further into the future. Um, and then the, the science fiction of the dystopian space seems to become very presentist. Mm -hmm. And um, so you mentioned that science fiction is now presentist, um, but I wondered, you know, if you were truly a utopian one, would you be thinking further or not? Um, do you think that matters or, or not? So, I mean, as I was sort of gesturing at in my talk, um, I'm really trying to do something that's topian, you know, that's not either, that's neither dystopian nor utopian, because I think that's as realistic as we can get in our storytelling. Um, a lot of the narratives that we think of from the 60s as classically utopian, like Star Trek, if you actually are a person like me who's watched as much Star Trek as there is available, um, you will know that there are many parts of the Star Trek universe that are deeply what we would call dystopian. Deep Space Nine is about that. It's about post-colonial relationships on a world that's been horrifically brutalized by an imperial force. Um, the new series, Discovery, which, you know, say what you will, it's a bit uneven, but it has an incredible uh, approach to thinking about science in the context of a world that has become devoted to war, and this ship that's a science ship is turned into a warship, this incredible science experiment with the mycelial network, which is kind of badass. I mean, it's like space mushroom network, um, uh, which is what they use to kind of teleport through time, or teleport through space and time. Anyway, um, it becomes weaponized. And so it becomes a fantastic thought experiment about a very dark turn, cultural turn, where um, a seemingly apolitical scientific project is politicized and weaponized. And so I think if you dig a little bit under the surface of almost any story that you think of as utopian or dystopian, you find that there's actually a lot more going on. Um, and, uh, and it's the same thing, like William Gibson is always being accused of being dystopian. I know he doesn't think he is dystopian. He thinks he's just realistic. Um, and he also often has quite delightful characters who have um, kind hearts and, and try to make the world better um, it, that you know, are, are really genuinely likable people, which you don't always see in science fiction. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the things I love about Gibson's work. So, um, so I try to always be mindful of staying in that space between, and I think now in the United States feels very dystopian because there's a lot of um, political and economic developments that are objectively bad um, in, I mean, for everyone. And so, I mean, the nation is having troubles where we're, we're, there's political strife um, and that's always bad. I don't mean like, I'm not trying to say like the president is evil, I'm just saying that times of political instability are bad. Um, and his, history kind of bears me out on that. So, um, so we feel dystopian because we're in a world where we feel very uncertain about the future. Um, but I think that our storytelling 
um, continues to be, you know, the best storytelling continues to be pretty nuanced. So I hope. I don't know. Hashtag weaponized shrooms, y'all. <laughs> That's my next um, band. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and actually on the, the Topian uh, front, uh, I, I, Kevin Kelly, our Long Now board member, I've recently heard him use the term protopian, meaning it's like at least 1% over of, of, of more utopian. It's like more better. It's like he wants a net, net-topian, <laughs> as it will, <laughs> net, net utopian, but it's not all total, but, but it ends up on the positive side. Um, when we talk about fiction as part of the scientific enterprise, what does that mean as far as the attention that needs to be coming from the more formal scientific apparatus? I mean, are, and are you kind of, do you, do you think that's happening right now? I mean, I, I think about, uh, and, and it's, you know, we have, uh, the, the, the internet serves as this amazing kind of omnipresent cultural blender that's ready to pick up uh, whether it's facts or fiction and yeah. spin it around and, and iterate on it. And um, we've had, you know, during your talk, I thought of a couple. Uh, we've had uh, Miles Traer, who's spoken for us, who's a geologist, and he's looked at Game of Thrones and reverse engineered what the geology of that planet needs to be. If you look up the geology of Game of Thrones, you can find it. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing website. Yeah, yeah I've talked to him. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, yeah, he used actually an, a, a tool that geologists use to map terrain and, and kind of talk about um, uh, plate tectonics and, and projected it onto Game of Thrones. So um, that's a great example. Yeah, and he, he already assumes it, it must be internally consistent so I can apply my scientific tools to it. He also does the carbon footprint of superheroes, which is a lot of fun too. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, um, um, and, and, then, and then on the flip side, we've had uh, Daniel Suarez spoke for us a long time ago and, and Dan's first book, uh, Damon, was about basically technologies that he saw around and he realized I could either write a white paper about these or I could write a thriller about them and I bet more people would pay attention if I wrote a thriller and, and it talked about how network technologies had some, some vulnerabilities, interesting things. So um, do, you, do you think there's the right level of kind of conversation or, or attention being paid to, and, and certainly as we've had Stan, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson speak here, that's what he, wa he is trying to be part of a dialogue. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Can it improve, and, and what would you... I, I definitely create? think, I mean, there's always room for improvement. Um, I think, you know, it really depends on the scientist and the project that they're working on. I think some scientists are super open to uh, thinking about their work in the context of culture and storytelling, um, and others prefer to be apolitical. Um, and that's, you know, changing, I think, or now. Or think they're being apolitical. They, they you know. Um, and... But I think one of the things that's been very positive, I feel, in the past couple of years is I've seen things like, I, I projected a picture up there from the Science March, which um, was a bunch of uh, marches organized in different cities, people just saying like, yeah, I'm pro-science. Like, I don't have a political agenda per se, but I guess you've made science into a political agenda. Um, a lot of scientists are going into politics now. Um, there's been a really strong move among uh, scientists locally. Um, uh, actually, Mike Eisen, who teaches uh, biology over at Berkeley, uh, is running for Senate, which is um, kind of weird, um, but kind of awesome. And, uh, and lots of other people are running uh, in more local races uh, as well. Um, people who've worked in environmental science, for example, which we could really use more environmental scientists and engineers and urban planners, I think, in politics. And like I said, for a long time, I think we sort of felt like, well, the scientific project doesn't need to touch politics, doesn't need to touch this map of the world that goes beyond the laboratory. And I think people, scientists now are more open to that idea and realize that, you know, if they want evidence from science to affect public policy and to affect things like, you know, resource allocation and infrastructure development, that they're actually going to have to go out there into that world beyond the ivory tower, beyond their corporate um, labs and do something. And I think that isn't the same thing as saying, like, you should read more science fiction, but it's the same impulse to, to do something that is cultural or political or speculative or social uh, that can't necessarily be quantified um, by repeatable testing, uh, but will nevertheless have a measurable effect on the world. Another question from, there we go. Hi. Thank you. Um, I have, I see. So I can, I can probably speak in everything. <laughs> um, you said in the beginning that fiction is not predictive um, of future science, but we are living in a world of 3D printing and all kinds of things that came from Star Trek. Star Trek. And 
I just wanted to just throw out, you know, to think a bit deep, more deeply on that, um, the whole idea of if we can imagine it, then it, it must be possible going all the way back to the platonic ideal and that kind of stuff. So what are your thoughts on that, just generally? I, I, I feel very strongly that if we can't imagine it, that somehow, just as humans, because we're tinkerers, that we will make it happen one, one way or another for a better course. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, don't, I didn't mean to say that um, imagination and speculation aren't involved in scientific discovery or, or technical innovation. I mean, obviously they are. Um, what I meant when I said science fiction isn't predictive is just that, well, like I said, no one can really predict the future. What we can do is we can look at the science and technology around us now and think about a, an, another, think speculatively about where they might fit into, say, a future civilization. One of the things, the reason I projected that picture up of Spock with the tricorder is because so we always think of the tricorder and the communicator as things that inspired mobile devices. And it's true, um, des early designs for mobile devices uh, were directly inspired by the, early, the original series communicators, not the little <laughs> pins that they have in Next Generation. That's what I want, like, Captain? <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a science fiction novel for you. Um, so uh, what, what Star Trek did that was so genius um, it, with the tricorder thinking about how it would be embedded in culture is that um, you may recall that there isn't just one kind of tricorder. Like everybody has the little purse with the tricorder and they bring <laughs> it down to the planet and they're like, boop, 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 oh, I've noticed the molecules are doing this. Um, however, there's also a medical tricorder, which has the little doohickey that comes off of it and I guess, I don't know, can do special biological measurements or things that are more um, localized. And that is a great example of thinking about how technology is really used because a lot of lazy science fiction would be like, tricorder, everybody has one, they do everything. But in Star Trek they were like, no, technology develops for special use cases or for special applications. And so you're not just gonna have like a tricorder, you're gonna have different kinds. And we assume that there's probably other kinds out there too. We just don't see them because we're on a spaceship and so we're not like veterinarians or whatever. You know, there's like a veterinarian tricorder and there's like a, an opera singer tricorder for like checking your throat muscles or whatever, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, I think that's what science fiction can do. So like I said, it's not a prediction, but it's a way of getting people to think about as you're developing technology, remember, it's not a one size fits all thing, right? Your tech is gonna be taken up and, and received in different ways by different communities. Um, so I think that's the importance of, of how science fiction works. I think of it as the difference between like a prediction, like a, a time prediction versus looking at things in space. I, I really think in terms of maps and spaces. And like that's how I sort of imagine technology and science fiction. It's in a map of a, spa of a social space or a political space. And we kind of look at how it kind of gets used in that map. Um, and it could be a literal map, like how are mobile devices used, say, in African nations versus European nations. And we can think about that in the present and then maybe project into a future where there's even more radically different uses of mobile devices in nations on those two continents. Another, where are you at? Okay, right back there. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was curious, I heard a couple new phrases tonight that I like, you were talking about human equivalent beings and I heard protopia. And, huh. and, and I know sort of how, how politically powerful sort of changes of, of framings and sort of rhetorical phrases can be. I'm curious if there's any others that you wish that people would use more of or that you've seen recently that you're like, ah, oh, I wish that people would just use this phrase instead. Actually, there is. Funny that, isn't it funny that you is that should a ask. a planted question? No, um, I've been thinking a lot because I'm working on this book about archaeology and about ancient civilizations. and. When I, I've been writing about Cahokia, which is um, a city that was built by Native Americans about a thousand years ago outside St. Louis. In fact, most of the city is under East St. Louis. It was this incredible city with like uh, pyramids and uh, you know, tons of people were living there. It was an enormous city, um, biggest city in, in North America until Europeans arrived. And um, the way that the city was run isn't, you know, archeologists don't think it was like what, what we think of as, as a city. Like there was no central authority really. I mean, there was some dude who stood on top of the mound um, and like maybe yelled at people, but there wasn't like a king or like a prince or a princess or whatever. Um, and the term that they use to describe it is a heterarchy. 
So um, instead of like a monarchy, uh, you have a heterarchy where there's multiple sources of power in the community. And in, in a lot of different Native American groups um, at that time, uh, there were these, this idea, and actually this is true in um, early European communities as well, instead of having like a central leader, you'd have like the people who deal with pottery, the people who deal with farming, the people who deal with ritual, the people who deal with cooking. Um, well, maybe cooking would be house by house, but like different areas that serve the community um, would have their own kind of group, like a guild, basically. Um, but a guild where there's no king. And so it was when, I, when archeologists first started using that term, it was really hard for me. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? What is a heterarchy? Um, but it's, it's plural power. Um, and it's such a great idea. And I think there's a lot of groups that we are all participating in, I think here in San Francisco perhaps, that have a bit of a heterarchic structure. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my word of the day. <laughs> Well, I, I love, you actually ended that in the perfect place for me to ask the last question I want to ask you, and then we, uh, they'll show you, she's going to stick around, we'd love to have you stick around, get your book signed, more books for sale in the back, and, and you're going to keep answering questions the whole time. Right? I will. Yeah, she's, she's, <laughs> no problem. Uh, she's on tap the rest of the night. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, you, you mentioned Gibson earlier, it, it kind of blows my mind the, um, his, his quote that uh, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed, feels just more real every second. But the thing I've been thinking about uh, more and more is that um, there are places where the future bogs down and, and where there's more future than, than less. And San Francisco and the Bay Area is definitely one of those places that has, it seems like, a lot of the future. As somebody who's been here and you know, it's it's great to have a science fiction writer who is a San Franciscan, because you know it's it's not so easy for anybody to be a San Franciscan these days. And um, having having been here as long as you have, having seen all these changes, and there's and there's a real, in a way, you know, you could almost say San Francisco is the is the fiction for Silicon Valley's uh, technology, if not science, uh, all the time. Yeah, um, in a lot of ways, yeah. What what are your thoughts about? Um, the future, the perspective on the future from this vantage point, and where that's good and maybe where that's not always so good. Um, so it's interesting, because uh, I, I love William Gibson, and I think that that quote is um, very catchy, uh, but I actually dr disagree. I think that the future comes to everywhere. Uh, I think we're all existing in exactly the same time, uh, and that what is unevenly distributed, of course, is wealth, not the future. Um, you know, Africa is going to be in the same future we are. Um, it's a whole continent of future. And uh, that was actually one of the reasons why I loved the uh, kind of, you know, in, in Black Panther, which is really just about a guy in a suit, you know, fighting bad guys. But we get this view. How many people saw Black Panther? Okay, good job. Um, so... Black Panther is from an, a hidden nation in Africa called Wakanda, which is uh, highly, it, very, very wealthy. Uh, they are technologically advanced because they are wealthy, and they are wealthy because they've exploited a resource they have access to called vibranium, which is what Captain America's shield is made out of, for those of you who are familiar with Captain America. Um, and it's just a super strong metal. It has all these other properties, too. It can do, like, all kinds of stuff. Um, and it's valuable, and they sell it for money so that they can have an incredibly advanced technology and wealthy nation and that, that feels very futuristic, but doesn't look like the vision of the future that we have here in San Francisco, which is like more like an Apple Store vision of the future. <laughs> um, and, and actually is literally white. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that was one of the things that um, a lot of us watching Black Panther thought was so amazing, was that it was a vision of the future that felt African. And it's very pan-African. And actually, people from Africa were like, what? Like, what is this? Because it like mixes up a bunch of different uh, tribal traditions. Um, it's like, I don't know, it's like pan-Asian food or something. It's pan-African futurism. Um, so I think that uh, it's important to remember when we talk about the future, 
what exactly we mean. And I think when you say, like, we have a lot of future piled up here in San Francisco, what we really mean is we have a lot of money here. Uh, we have a lot of rich people here. We have a lot of investment here. Um, and I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, it's resulted in a lot of really cool things that I love and use every day, like my phone and my internet and my Google, um, and which is, of course, mine, all mine. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I mean, I, I reap the benefits of it. Um, so I think that, um, you know, the perspective that we get in San Francisco is the perspective of wealth. And that gives us um, just as narrow a perspective as you would get uh, living in Saskatchewan, um, where my characters are from in my novel. Um, you know, growing up on a farm in rural Saskatchewan, um, you know, it seems like from our perspective would just give you this very limited view of the world. Um, but how many of you know what it's like to grow up on a farm in Saskatchewan? Probably not that many, except for Jesse right here, um, and um, <laughs> who didn't even really grow up on a farm, so you don't even know. Um, so I think that it's you know no matter where you are, uh, you know you you have to remember that um, there's always other perspectives, and so that's like the whole point that I'm trying to make is that um, the future looks different depending on where you're standing. Um, and, you know, we think it looks like money. Um, other places might think the future looks like something else. Um, and it's important when you're, and this is like to tie it back to why science needs fiction and stories and, um, you know, personal stories, for example, is that when you're designing technology, oftentimes the temptation is to design it for that white Apple store, right? Like all the white people in the white Apple store. Um, but those are not your users, that's not the world, um, that's not who ultimately will receive that technology or that science. And so the more that we can have stories, uh, science fiction stories or otherwise, that place technology in different contexts, like Wakanda, um, for example, the more we actually have a really robust uh, and, and diverse ecosystem of science and tech. And I think that's what's gonna make the future um, you know, be a more hospitable place for the maximum number of intelligent beings, so. Annalie Newitz, everybody.